Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Okay, the armor of God. Uh, gird up your loins. It's the first part we're going to talk about. So turn to Ephesians 6.10. We're going to read through Ephesians 6.10. And then we're going to talk about the first... It's supposed to be, they say, the first part of the armor of God. Yet, when we read this, we're going to find out there's more to it. Okay. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember in the intro, we talked about putting on the whole armor of God. So as we go through here, we're going to be relating this, every piece that we're mainly focusing on, we're going to be relating it to some of the other pieces too. Okay? And explaining why without this piece, the other piece are worthless. Without this piece, the other pieces are worthless. It takes the whole armor of God to do what? so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in that evil day, and, done all, and have done all to stand. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 16. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. When we finally get to the shield, I found that interesting about quench. Okay. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and Washing there in two to, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The main part we're going to be talking about today is girding up your loins. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Now we already read over there that you have the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Okay. Jesus said we're going to get to this. Sanctify thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then it goes through. Um, talks about I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. When it says, gird up your, about your loins with truth, what's it talking about? It's talking about the word of the Lord. Okay, Truth, having truth about you, about, uh, around you, in you, the way you speak, how you live your life. But I'm going to ahead of myself a little bit. So what we're going to be talking about is your loins girt about with truth. It's the first part it's talking about. So the first thing is, when I show nothing's over here, the coin uh, in the intro... It always tries to show them wearing a belt, okay? What this means is you put up a belt, and the belt holds your pants up, or stuff like that. And it's like, uh, that's not what it's talking about. When I've done some study, God's shown me some things, okay? Is it talking about a belt? Turn to 1 Samuel 24, 4. Back to the Old Testament. And the men of David said unto him, as when they were in the cave, I think, uh, there's two incidences, but where Saul's there with them. Yeah, it's in the cave. Okay. Saul's with them in the cave, and they happen to be in the cave too. So this is King David, and you have, or David that will, soon, will later become King David, and you have King Saul. Verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Okay. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's, Saul's skirt. There's people who try to grab this and say, well, you know, men wear skirts, so you know it's okay for women to wear pants. It's the skirt of the robe. Men wore robes back then for the Jewish people. Okay? Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 27, it says, And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent it. This is talking about uh, Samuel. 
uh, Saul grabbing Samuel. So sometimes you would have a robe that's one piece, or you'd have a robe that folds over, and you'd have a belt that's called a mantle. So sometimes it can be a belt, but sometimes it's not a belt. We're going to talk about what I believe the Bible's talking about when it says, gird up your loins. Okay? But yes, sometimes in the Bible, I want to mention that, that it is talked about like as a mantle. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 4 says, And the same John had his raiments of camel hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So you see, he had a girdle. He had one of those robes that open up, so he folds it over, and you have a girdle that holds it closed. Okay? You have one of those. Uh, Job 38.3, we got so many scriptures, so sometimes I'm going to be turning into them. If you can pause the video and turn if you want to. But Job 38.3 says, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Okay? Men gird up their loins. We're going to find out why. Job 40.30, Gird up thy loins now like a man, I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. So what's this really talking about? You look up the word girt. To gird, to surround. This is the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay? And people will say, well, you see, it's talking about a belt. But bear with me. Okay? The other one we lear learned was there's girt. And then we, one of the words we read up there was gird. Okay? So, or I'm sorry, girt, it says to gird, to surround. So I looked up the word gird. And the Western 28 Dictionary says, To bind by surrounding with, an, with any flexible substance, as with a twig, a cord, bandage, or cloth, as to gird the loins with sackcloth. Uh, two, to make fast by binding, to put on, usually with on, as to gird on a harness, to gird on a sword. Okay, remember what it is? It says, Your loins gird about with truth. Verse 5, To furnish to equip. You're set it up. Uh, we have today, we have belts, uh, utility belts. You can have stuff on the utility belts that help you with your work. It's right there for you to grab and use. Okay. But I got some pictures over here. I'm going to put them on when, I, when we do the rendering and everything. It's going to be on the screen for you. So I'm going to be looking over here as I'm talking because I want to be able to relate this as you guys see it. But what I believe the Bible's talking about when it says, gird up your loins, it's talking about this guide that I'm going to put up right now, and it says how to gird up your loins. And I'm not understand that this isn't, like I said, we read, there's times where they use belts. There's times where you had, uh, uh, you had what this picture is showing, and then you had a robe that, oh, that folds closed, because they had jackets where they'd take the jackets off, and they'd be like robes over a robe, you know. But if you're looking at this picture with me, look at the steps here, okay. The tunic wouldn't allow you to do heavy labor or fight in battle, necessitating, necessitating the girdling of one's loins. First, hoist the tunic up so that all the fabric is above the knees. This will give you mobility. Gather all the extra materials in front of you so that the back of the tunic is snug against your backside. Verse 4. Once the excess fabric is gathered in front, pull it underneath and between your legs to your rear, this feels much like a diaper. And <laughs> it'll start looking like a diaper. Like the old, uh, verse, uh, step five. Gather half of the material in each hand, bring it back around to the front. Okay, you bring it back around the front. Finally, tie your two handfuls of material together and you're all set for both battle and some hard labor. Go forth, be ye men, and gird up your loins. Remember we read there, go up now, my, now uh, gird up thy loins like a man, for I'll demand of thee and answer thou me. That we read in Job 38, 3. This is, the reason I'm pointing this out, brother, sister Christ, is because it's an action. And you do it for two reasons. You do it for work, hard labor, and you do it for war. And it says with truth. So when it comes to truth, you're going to have to fight for truth, and you're going to have to work for truth. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's going to take work. 
right? You've got to gird your loins up. Now, if you see the picture that I'm showing, it shows how there's other ways. You can look up, there's other ways, but basically it pulls it up so you can run. You can bend over easily. You can do a lot of heavy lifting and just, you know, you do a lot of manual labor. Okay? Now, the next picture I want to show you guys is why this is, I believe this is what it's talking about is, um, I hope I get a good picture that will come out pretty good. This is the sword I'd like to get. Okay? I got a sword around here somewhere. It's up there somewhere. But it's, it's, not, the, it's not the sword I believe. It's a one-handed sword is what this is talking about. As you know, for It's talking about the Word of God. When it says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But it's one hand. One hand you have the Word of God. And the other hand you have the shield of faith. You have faith. The Word of God and faith. And we're going to read some verses that without faith it is impossible to please Him. Okay? Um, so we're going to be talking about that. But the picture I'm showing is, is look how it has the hooks there. On the sheath where the sword goes in. Those hooks go around after you've girded up your loins with that cloth. You use those hooks to, go, to gird around it. Okay? And then you pull out your sword when it's needed. Okay, I put down here, if you had it out all the time, no one would want to be around you. And I'm talking about fighting, okay? We're supposed to quote the word, word of the Lord all the time with our life. This is the foundation of our life. But we're talking about there's two work. We're doing the work of the Lord or we're fighting for the Lord. If all you are is just fight, 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 you know, most people won't want to talk, talk to you. You pull it out and you fight when it's necessary to fight for the Lord. Okay. And in these last days, <laughs> it's like it seems like all we're doing is fighting because it's like no, very few of us are on the same page, <laughs> have the same sword, and believing in that sword and know how to use that sword. Okay, okay I'm trying to read. To say, just like God's word is hid in our hearts, remember, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Just like God's word is hidden in our hearts and we speak it when it is needed, which is a lot. I said that. But remember, there's a time to speak and a time to keep silent. Ecclesiastes 3.7. This one I like. Old Testament. Ecclesiastes. It says, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Okay? There's times where there, it's, it, you need to speak up, we need to fight the good fight, and there's times where you're just going to sit there and you're not going to say anything. Okay? There's a time to talk and there's a time not to talk. Okay? You read through uh, Paul, his ministry, there was a time to preach the gospel and there was a time not to. There was times where he was told not to preach the gospel in Asia. He didn't preach the gospel to the, um, I don't know what the words, I can't remember the words it uses, like the people that were on the island. I don't know if it used the word heathens or something like that, but the people that were on the island that rescued him, he didn't preach the gospel to him right away. Okay, There's a time to speak and there's a time not to speak. There's fights that you're, God's going to say, go in there and fight the good fight. And then there's some fights that God's going to say, uh, that's not a fight worth fighting. He's going to say, you know, it's, or he'll say it's not a fight worth fighting right now. Right. Hold off for a bit. Just wait. You know? I don't know uh, that whole thing about you have a group of people fighting each other. You're like, hold off. Let them, you know, take each other out and, and dwindle the numbers down. And then God's like, okay, now go in there. You know? But uh, something like that. But there's a time to speak and a time not to speak. There'll be a time that you need to verbally stand for the Word of God. And there's a time where the Bible talks about... Um, not casting your pearls before swine that turn around and rend you. Okay? There's a time where we're going to preach the Word of God because you have someone, God's got, that guy's ready to listen. Talk to him. And there's going to be times where God puts on your heart where you get upset because I didn't talk to that man. But God put on your heart, that man ain't ready. You'd have been casting pearls before swine. Okay? So remember that. So we got the pictures in your head. The girding up your loins. It's an action. Okay? You gird up your loins to do what? To do work. Okay? You gird up your loins to do battle. 
to fight. Now we said in the intro, like I said, we're going to try to connect this to things um, as we go through these studies and, and go through a lot of these scriptures that we're going to go through. But we also said about proving yourselves. Okay, you gird up your loins, you gird it up with the right sword. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find out real quick when people don't have the right sword. And, they're not, and you can tell when people don't gird up their loins. How does this apply to all the other parts of the armor? I've got my sword, I've got my shield, I've got my helmet, I've got my breastplate, but I didn't gird up my loins. I go to step out to go fight, and I fall flat on my face. You just, you can't walk, you can't run, you just flat on your face. That's the easiest way to connect these to the rest. Okay, and to prove your own selves, all right? you got to learn how to gird up your loins. Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, we said this already, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Needeth not to be ashamed. If you don't gird up your loins properly and you go out there to do some work, you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to drop the hammer, you're, you know, if you're doing work. If you're going to go out to, the, to war and you didn't gird up your loins properly, um, you're going to fail the Lord and be not that effective. You can hardly move around and, do, and be as mobile. Right? The more of this you hide in your heart, God's Word, the more of it's going to be on your lips. The more of it's going to be in your life, applying it to your life. Because when, you when it comes to the work, when we're talking about work and doing war, work is your life. War has to do with the world and other people. We fight for the Word of God, that's what includes other people. When we do the work of the Lord, it starts with us first. And then for the ministry of reconciliation. Then for the body of Christ, if you get called into a, a position to be a preacher or a teacher. okay, uh, Praying for one another, holding each other accountable. Then it starts to include other people. But when it comes to work, it starts with you first before it, it, it has to do with anybody else. Okay, girding up your loins starts here. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Okay. Now, why does it start with girding about with truth? Because we're going to go in this in the order that the Bible has it. So why does it say girt about truth? First thing I did as a professing Christian, what led me to Christ, the real Jesus Christ, was the Bible version issue study. I got into uh, Brother Son pointed me to Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, and I started going through all his Bible version issue studies. And he pointed out for two, and I don't like to support the man now because I believe he's fallen away, uh, Sam Gipp. But at the time, I, you, know, you got Sam Gipp, then uh, Peter Ruckman, and you got these other guys, uh, Chick Publications. You had these guys that were really vehemently standing for the Word of God as far as letting you know what Bible is the Word of God. King James Bible, God's perfect written word for the English-speaking people. And they show evidence and proof and facts and everything. That's why it says gird about with truth is the first part, and I think is the most important. It's why it starts with that. And what does it end with? Okay. It ends with, And take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So it starts with girding your back loins about with truth, and it ends with the sword that you're, that you're putting on your loins, on your waist. Picture that I showed you about the uh, Hebrew sword. Okay, That's why it's so important. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Notice who this is written to. <laughs> Paul was in the, with Corinthians. He was dealing with a lot of false converts mixed in with saved when it comes to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But look what it says here, 2nd Corinthians 11, 1. And we're going to read all the way down to 4. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, another gospel which ye have not accepted, 
ye might well bear with him. The whole point of this is, I had Bible perversions, I was a professing Christian most of my life, I grew up in the Bible buildings, and it got to a point where, in order to gird up my loins with truth, you had to have the truth. I didn't have the truth. And I got pointed to the Bible version issue. So then I started getting into the Bible version issue. Okay, this is God's word. Now, God's like, now let me show you who I am. The real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible this is the real Jesus. And it talks about the fake Jesuses, the Antichrist Jesus. We just read about one instance right there. If you preach another Jesus whom we have not preached. If you're not girding up your loins, how can you distinguish the difference between the Jesus of this world, the Antichrist spirit that's in the world today, from the real Jesus Christ of Scripture? If you don't have this, if you're not 2 Timothy 2.15, if you're not reading your Bible every day and studying your Bible every day and applying it to your life, girding up your loins, doing the work, it takes work to study, it takes work to get in your life and say, okay, God wants that out. God says, I'm supposed to be doing this. He says, stay away from that. Stay away from that group over there. Those people are false. These people are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what I'm saying? You're girding up your loins. It takes work. And as you get going and you're getting used to girding up your loins, you get used to this book, knowing how to use it, because you hide it in your heart, that's when you get ready to start fighting. Okay, when you gird up your loins. And you start fighting for the Word of God. Okay? But why does it start with the girding up the loins with truth? Because without God's perfect written word, you will not be able to figure out who Jesus is. This world, I remember doing studies on it, over half the population, and this was like 10 years ago they did the study, or 15 now, it's been a while. Um, over half the world's population believes in a Jesus Christ. Jesus warned that there would be many antichrists. Okay? There's just so many different false Jesuses out there. How can you tell the difference? You gird up your loins with truth. You study. Okay. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. That's why I talked about you had to get saved. I had to get saved first. I had to get brought to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. That way I knew where the truth was. Now I can start girding my loins up after God saved me. I can start growing up my loins with truth. Uh, two things we're going to talk about next. Manifest word, just real quick, and the written word. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He says, I am the way, the truth. So when you're growing up your loins with truth, you have the written word, and you have the manifest word. When Jesus spoke, it was God speaking. Okay? And notice he says, the truth, singular, not truths. There's many truths, many paths. No. One truth, Jesus Christ. One truth, one Bible in English. Perfect written word of God. Not multiple. Okay? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Lowercase case w. Okay? Once again, truth here is singular. Okay? It's not all truth is relative. It, there's one truth. And Jesus Christ is that truth. And he can give us that one truth. One Bible in English. One Jesus Christ found in that Bible. The Bible talks about the hidden man of the heart. For the women, okay, how we're supposed to have Jesus in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible says, uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, Psalms 138.2 says, I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Jesus' spoken word and the written word are more important than his name. And I remember coming across some of these people way back when, when Brian at uh, King James Video Ministries brought this out, because he's who I found that out from. Sometimes I'll learn things from Peter Ruckman, from some other brethren in, in Christ out there, but 
I'll give credit where credit's due. It's from the Word of God, but I got that from uh, Brother Brian saying, because you have some people that say, well, I just love Jesus, I just love Jesus. Well, you wouldn't know who Jesus is if it wasn't for His perfect written Word. You wouldn't. Whether it's the spoken Word where Jesus is speaking, the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, that's how we got uh, the letters from Paul, from Peter, from John, but the Holy Spirit speaking through them. And we have it written down. But today we have the perfect written Word of God. Mm -hmm. So you have those two. The hidden man of the heart, for the women's talking about, uh, for the women. Uh, for us, we have Jesus Christ in us also. Men do too. But I'm just talking about that verse is talking to women at the time, but it's saying the hidden man of the heart. Okay? Gird up thy loins with truth. You gotta make sure that Jesus is here. That's the most important thing you gotta get figured out when you first get saved, okay? Am I hiding God's word in my heart? Is Jesus here? This book is a spiritual book. It requires the Holy Spirit to open it up. I was a false convert for most of my life. I never did that check. I was just like, hey, they just said I'm saved, I'm saved. I could live like, look like the world, act like the world, and, you know, do whatever I wanted and just say I'm a Christian. And I had all these Bible perversions, and I didn't, I haven't read any of them top to bottom. And I had like four or five different Bible perversions. I had the Message, the NIV, the New King James, and I think it was the NASV. So maybe I had four. But um, I haven't read any of those books top to bottom. You know, I didn't understand any of those books either. But the point is, is you've got to gird up your loins with truth. It's you got to make sure that you have Jesus in your heart and that you're hiding God's word in your heart. That's what girding up is. And how do you prove that? By the life you live. The work you're doing for the Lord, does it line up with Scripture? Does the life you're living line up with Scripture? What's your attitude towards sin? What's your attitude towards absolute truth? What's your attitude towards the real Jesus Christ? I'm throwing this out because we come across so many people out there that claim to be Christians and they love Jesus. And when you start throwing the real Jesus at them, their Jesus actually lines up with the Antichrist that the Bible talks about. Satan. Does it line up with the Jesus Christ? The Son of God, the Jesus Christ who is God fully and completely. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See how we're getting in the tide to the shield of faith. When you go up your loins with truth, you have to have faith in that truth. I believe that this is God's perfect written word. I believe in the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. I have faith in Him. He knows what He's doing. He knows what's going on in the world. He shows me through His word what's going on in the world. Okay? What I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do. Acts 17.11 reads, These were more noble than those at Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily where those things were so. Guarding up the loins with truth. Someone says, the Bible says, uh, you say chapter and verse. That's supposed to be our response, brothers and sisters of Christ, chapter and verse. And real quick, not to get too much on a side note, but I've been noticing this a lot lately, and I'm doing this to encourage the brethren. But a lot of times we're so quick to say the Bible says such and such, but we don't quote the Bible. We don't show where. I mean, you don't have to actually put out the whole verse. You could just do the address. But a lot of times, people are getting so used to just saying the Bible says this, and they don't show where it actually says it. Other people can come along and say, the Bible says this, and you get so used to just taking people at their word. That's not what they did. They had readiness in mind. They received the word with readiness in mind, and searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Our response is supposed to be chapter and verse. But our attitude also, we need to start quoting scripture more instead of just, thus saith me, and you can be 100% correct, it's in the Bible. But you need to actually start quoting the Bible. It also helps you, you know, memorize the Bible. It helps you to remember verses more when you're actually, even if it's copy and pasting or typing out the verse. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 2.13 
It's all going to connect in a second. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. For when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. When you're growing up with your loins of truth, that shield of faith is important. And we already talked about this, like I said, you're going to trip, but that sword will not be able to go on, on your waist if you're not girding up your loins with truth. And you can't, and when it says girding up your loins with truth, remember we said truth singular. You gotta make sure you have the right sword on. And only the right sword will fit if you're girding up your loins with truth. If you're girding up your loins with lies and deceit and uh, worldly opinions and feelings and whatnot, then the right sword won't fit. It just won't. Remember, effectually worketh in you that also believe. This book will work if you have faith in it and you believe it. It's God's perfect written word. 1 Corinthians 11.31 reads, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. How do you judge yourself? By girding up your loins. And you're supposed to be doing it Every day, every morning, you're supposed to be putting on the whole armor of God. You don't just put it on when you're going to fight. You're supposed to put it on every morning. When you're doing the work, living your day-to-day -day life for Jesus Christ, as well as going out and doing battle. Okay? People think it's just for battle. It's just for battle. No, there's times where you have what's called a sentry, where you're sitting there just guarding a post. You're sitting there to guard, okay? you got your home. You're to guard and make sure that home stays safe and it stays a godly home. Okay. You might not see battle every day, but lately in these last days, um, we're going to be battling the world. We're going to be battling Satan, because I talked about that. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But you're going to be battling, if, they're lo if someone's lost and rejects Jesus Christ, Satan can use them. Satan can kind of trip up people who are saved and get you to ruin your testimony too. But for the most part, you're going to be fighting the lost world. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword. When you gird up your loins with truth, that's the sword that Jesus is talking about. He's going to set a man at variance against his father, a mother against her daughter, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a, a, a man's foe shall be they of his own household. I don't have this in my notes, I don't think. But the point is, is you're going to be struggling with people that are lost. You're going to be trying to fight the good fight. You're going to be fighting your flesh. That's the biggest thing you're going to be fighting most of your life. Uh, there's sometimes you're going to be struggling and fighting amongst brethren. There's going to be fighting amongst brethren. I, mean, I wish it wasn't so, but... It seems to happen where uh, brethren are fighting. Okay. But there's going to be a time to fight. Like we said, time to speak and time to be quiet. But there's a time to fight and there's a time not to. Okay. So, capital W word is the spoken word. Uh, lowercase w word is the written word. And when you read that written word, it's God speaking through you through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost opens this book to you. Remember what we said that the sixth part, that most people don't realize the sixth part of the armor of God is the Holy Ghost, the saved sinner. Okay? You need to be that saved sinner. You need the Holy Ghost. Right? Without the Holy Ghost, none of the other parts of the armor, pieces of the armor of God mean anything if you don't have the Holy Ghost in you. Oh, I had to put down here, some people like the book that have the red letters. This is when Jesus is speaking, and people tend to take the red letters more important than the rest of the book. Okay, You treat the whole, you need to come to this whole book like this is God's word, perfect. Okay? Not just, I don't know, people really get into the red letters. 
uh, the um, Bibles where they try to put the words of God in, in red. And it's like, this is all God's Word. The Holy Spirit's going to speak through you in all of this. He's going to show you things. Remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You gird up your loins with truth to do good works. The Bible talks about how good works can be reprobate. What is it? They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, let's see, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Those good works are reprobate. Okay. Turn to Hebrews 11.6. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We already did that one. James 1.5. Okay. You're girding up your loins with truth. James 1.5. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. There's the shield of faith. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. You know there's a lot of people that are going to get you to doubt the Word of God. There's going to get a lot of people that are going to get you so messed up because they want to, um, they'll misquote Scripture, they'll take stuff out of context, they'll try to tell you that's not written to us when it is, or they'll tell you it's written to us when it's not. That's why the Bible says rightly dividing the Word of Truth. That says, but let him ask in faith, not wavering. That shield. And when we get to that shield, it's not this huge square shield either. Like you see them, they always do like the Roman soldiers, a huge, it's not a huge square shield. Okay. Remember what the Bible said about the faith of, the, uh, of a mustard seed? As small as the mustard seed can move mountains. You don't need a huge, huge shield. Okay. Uh, verse 6, I'm sorry. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not the man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I use that verse a lot. Double-minded uh, double man is unstable in all his ways. When we get to the shield... I almost want to like the shield. It's not a shield made of wood. It's a shield made of water. Because remember it says, quench the fiery darts. And we see right there, what we just read right there, way, um, for he that wave, but let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Remember the story about uh, Peter going out on the water. As long as he kept his eye on Jesus, everything was fine. When he started looking at the world, all the water, the waves, the, the wind, everything going crazy, he started to sink. He started to waver. Okay. But that's for the shield of faith. But I want to throw that in there that it's connected. But we ask God for wisdom. God opens up his, this truth to us. When we go up to gird up our loin and we do the work of truth, God's the one that helps us. Okay. That is why it's also called, uh, the truth is also called the sword of the Spirit. Okay. That's why it's, it's a, like I said before, this is a spiritual book. It takes the Holy Spirit, that's why it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It takes the Holy Spirit to open this book to you. That's why you pray to God, Lord open this book to me. I read, I don't have this in my notes where it talks about how the Holy Spirit, what He hears, that He speaks. God the Father speaks to us through the Holy Spirit and opens this book to us. Right. Ephesians 4.11 And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So we see the work. What's one of the reasons you gird up your loins? For work. For the edifying of the body of Christ. 
till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Remember what we read over there? Not wavering like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. We're not supposed to be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Craftiness, oh, you don't need to gird up your loins. Here's a belt. Oh, you don't want that sword. Here's a better sword. They're cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Oh, you know, the Romans rode to hell. That's just, that's not for us today. It's all about deceit, brothers and sisters in Christ. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. After He saves you, He changes your life. You go, you get, you go through what's like going through boot camp. You put on the whole armor of God. God changes your life. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Right? But they'll try to tell you that's not true, that's not true. You're created in Christ Jesus and two good works. Oh no, that's not true, that's not true. What are they doing? What we just read there, trying to be crafty, and they do it in craftiness. And they try to sound good, and they try to quote different scriptures, and they take scriptures out of context. You've got to study the Word of God. And that's what girding up your loins is. Getting to work. All right? Verse 15. And remember, you've got to believe that this is God's perfect written Word. Or God won't show you anything in it. But verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. Girding up your loins with truth. Okay. When you go to speak the truth, even if you're doing it out of love for a brother and sister in Christ, or you feel like, hey, I'm going to be standing for the truth, and I'm fighting, fighting for the truth, it's still supposed to be done out of love. For the lost world, my love for the lost world, I want to see him get saved. Okay. When I gird up my loins with truth, to do the work of the Lord, or if I have to fight for the Lord, I'm still doing it for love. Helping a brother and sister in Christ out, or helping the lost world out by preaching the truth to them. Okay. May grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fit jointly together and compact, compacted by that which every joint supplieth accordingly to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Just like with the whole part of the armor of God. You've got to have the whole armor of God on and it fits together. And it's got to be proven every day. You've got to learn to have that whole armor of God on every day. Verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Remember we talked about if you don't gird up your loins properly, you're going to be stumbling around and look weird and you can't even walk straight when you're trying to do work. So when you gird up your loins with truth, that allows you to walk properly. And we see this here. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, and the vanities of their mind, having the, understand, having, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. We have the truth in us. Now, I'm going to keep preaching this. Thy word have I hid in my heart. The hidden man of the heart. You have the Holy Spirit in your heart, and you have God's word in your heart. The lost world doesn't. And when it comes to people proving themselves, you can have a lot of people that are newly saved. When I was newly saved, I, I kind of like tripped over my words. and I, I was a PWC there for a while, just parroting what I would, with all the lies that I was taught as a false convert. I was kind of bringing that into my saved life. And God had to get that stuff out of my vocabulary and whatnot. But ultimately, when you're saved and God opens this book to you, you're going to start looking at it. People go, wait a second, did he just say what he sa I think he said? That goes against Scripture. Okay? That's the whole point of girding up your loins with truth and hiding God's Word in your heart. Because of, thy, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings 
having, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. It always comes back to that, feelings and opinions, feelings and opinions, and giving in to the flesh. Oftentimes when people are, when I've seen that people are off on scripture, this isn't always true, so don't you know, hold me to it 100%. But most of the time, it's because of the flesh. What we just read right there. The number one reason why people will start fail, will teach wrongly or be off somewhere in Scripture is because of lasciviousness, to work uncleanness, with greediness. You know, feelings, past feelings. There's something in their life that God's saying, get out of your life, and they're trying to justify it. And they'll be messed up in Scripture. Or their home, if your home is not 100% a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, you know, something in there to distract you, cares of this world. But more than anything, it's just usually when someone's off in a teaching, it's because of sin. And they're going off of feelings and opinions, and they're not going after Christ. Okay? What was it the Bible talks about? Um, were they spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, after the traditions of men, and not after Christ? You can get spoiled by philosophy and the rudiments of the world. And oftentimes, philosophy and the rudiments of the world is based off the flesh. The world's way is the fleshly way. It's always going to be contrary to God's way. Okay. Verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Are you in the truth? then you're in Jesus. If you're not in the truth, you're not in Jesus. Verse 22, That ye puff up concerning the former conversation, the old man. If you talk on the old man, people just... They, a good example of somebody who's false is they will... They, when you try to talk about how the old man is supposed to be dead and buried with Christ, crucified with Christ, and your new man is supposed to be raised with Christ, and they fight that... That's a red flag to me. Okay? But right here, we put off the former conversation the old man. I had to because the old man was a false convert, a fake, a fraud. I had so much lies put into me and the ways of the world and feelings and opinions and like I just said, uh, philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, after traditions of men, not after Christ. Okay, I had to put that off the former conversation. I had to make sure that my conversation lined up with Scripture. That's why I use Bible words. Part of this ministry is words have meaning. All right. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. The old man, absolutely. 23. And being renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Once again, the new creature in Christ Jesus. 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Okay. Truth. The new man. You get to start putting on the whole armor of God. You start girding up your loins. You start realizing, I'm not the same man I used to be. I'm not the same woman I used to be if you're a sister in Christ. Okay? You're different. You get out of basic training. I said that in the intro. You get out of basic training. I wasn't the same man that I was when I went in. Okay? You're not supposed to be the same man uh, or woman you were when you were lost as a saved person. There's supposed to be a difference. There's supposed to be a change. Okay? So when you're girding up your loins with truth, we're going to start going through. It's going to be a little bit longer study than normal, but we're going to go through some things. The first thing we're going to talk about is obeying the truth. When you're girding up your loins with truth to do the work of truth and to fight for truth, in order to do those two things, you've got to obey truth. 